Good afternoon, and thank you for welcoming me here, and thank you very much, Aubrey and Martin, for the invitation to speak at the Longevity Summit here in Dublin. So yes, my name is Neve Joyce. I am an obstetrician gynecologist uh, with a special interest, um, or subspecialty fellowship in reproductive medicine, uh, with a focus on fertility preservation, and also working with a complex menopause cohort. So today I'm just going to briefly talk about a more clinical um, aspect of what we do um, in comparison to a lot of the brilliant scientific uh, work that has been presented here today and possibly echoing on some of the um, points that have been made by Miguel and Maria. Um, so I'm going to talk about our cancer project for uh, children at the Marian Fertility Clinic uh, that's in uh, conjunction with the National Maternity Hospital and Children's Health Ireland. Um, I'm just briefly going to go over again ovarian development, physiology and ageing the effect of cancer on gonadal function, survivors of cancer treatment, and fertility preservation, the options that these um, individuals have. So this is our hospital uh, with the red door in the front. This is the National Maternity Hospital on the south side of the city. Um, uh, the arrow there indicates where the Marian Fertility Clinic is, and we work very closely together. The National Maternity Hospital was founded in 1898 uh, through charitable, charitable donations and delivers about 8,000 babies per year. The Marian Fertility Clinic was then founded in 1998. So just a bit about our project. Um, it has been funded very generously by the Irish Cancer Society. It allows us to address a cohort of patients that have no public funding or government backing. Uh, we treat adolescents under the age of 18 who have active disease. They are prospubertal children and young adults. They are about to undergo gonadotoxic treatment and they have access to a bespoke treatment. Um, there, we recently have started then seeing survivors of childhood cancer, and these are people who are under the age of 27 but have been exposed to gonadotoxic treatment in their early, uh, early life. From here then we also have prepubertal children. For these children we unfortunately are not able to offer them any services within Ireland and they have to travel abroad. Our, our, these children are supported very much so by Oxford University Hospital and they support us in the development of our programme as well. So I will see biological females and males, but for the purpose of this talk, we'll focus on females. And in order to see them, they will have to be candidates who are about to undergo gonadotoxic treatment. These are typically the most toxic treatments would be hemopoietic stem cell transplants where they use alkylating agents that are irreversibly damaging to the gonadal function. Uh, these children have to be post-pubertal, they need to have an established menstrual cycle, they need to be clinically fit, um, and they have to have enough time to allow us to perform um, ovarian preservation before they have to start their treatment. This is not always the case, in which case, instead of going for egg freezing, they'll have to go for tissue freezing. Um, they have to be psychologically fit for the procedure. It is not to be underest underestimated how difficult this is for young children to, do, to go through, particularly when they are sick. And they have to have the support of their parents and the, and the de desire themselves to go ahead with this procedure. Um, and again, they have to be less than the age of 18. At the age of 14 and above, or around the peripubertal stage, uh, they need to be discussed because of their high rates of aneuploidy, and the significance of that might be um, significant for egg freezing and the future use of those eggs. With regards to survivors of childhood cancer, I will see these patients in a 30-minute consultation. They will have a pelvic ultrasound, um, and they will have an antimalarian hormone level check, and the outcome will be either that we recommend that they have annual surveillance or if they should go for fertility preservation. And this is a leaflet that we give to patients. So again, this is a picture of the ovary. The ovarian reserve is constituted of the primordial follicles. We've already heard that before in the last two presentations. It's established early in life, it declines throughout life, and it is a source of follicles for the entire reproductive span of an individual or a woman's life. This um, image here is, is very useful in, in that it demonstrates on the left side of the screen, this is gonadotropin independent um, uh, ovarian function, so, or, or follicular development. This is a stage where we don't really know a lot about this stage. This is where there are massive amounts of oocytes that are lost through a tretic process. And it's only then under the influence of FSH and LH that comes with puberty that the follicles are then recruited and grown to a stage of maturation. And then we also have a, a continued loss of ovarian reserve. Within the oocyte itself, there are signaling pathways that become activated. Uh, the phosphorylation pathway, PI3K, is a very well-established and studied uh, uh, signaling pathway that activates the oocyte. Then in conjunction with the granulosa cells that surround the oocytes, there's the M4 signaling pathway also activates uh, cellular or, or follicle growth. This graph here is a 
it comes from a very well studied paper uh, by Wallace and Kelsey, um, and it basically illustrates the, uh, the population of non growing follicle populations throughout the lifespan or the reproductive lifespan from conception through to menopause. Um, at conception, the um, germ cells will migrate into the yolk sac around, say, four to six weeks, and then they will migrate back to the gonadal ridge. <clears throat> From there, um, there will be significant episodes of mitosis where we have up to seven million um, ugonial cells that are, that are clustered and then they separate into primordial follicles. And there on forward is a very wasteful process where these oocytes are uh, consumed and, 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 and are very and are atretic. You can see here at birth we have, this says here 300,000, we believe there might be a bit more uh, than that, but there is this downward decline. And you can see here the, the, the range between the different populations and densities. So each woman will have a variation of how much her primordial follicle density will be at the outset of birth. And that really does, this graph emphasizes that that dictates when the onset of menopause will, will occur. From the same study, this graph also um, depicts the same, uh, same message, but it, it clearly states that if you can see at the age of 15 down here below, around that, peri, or that pubertal stage, a woman has lost about 50% of her reproductive pool. Then at the age of 30, there is this acceleration then thereafter, but at 30, these studies that are based on histolo histological analyses show us that there's about a 12% reserve left of the uh, primordial pool. And then at 40, tragically, about 3%, and not only then are we looking at low numbers, but we have low quality, and there is no way that we can really identify the quality of eggs. So with regards to child cancer, um, Childhood cancer has seen significant benefits in the sense that over the last number of decades there, have been, has there, there has been an over 80% survival, five-year five survival rate of children who have had childhood cancer. This is largely due to the fact that we have um, significant advances in chemotherapy and, and, um, and protocols that these, these children are put on. However, as Maria mentioned, these are agents that target tissue non-specifically and the um, the, the, the ovaries and testicles are, are, are prime targets for these um, medications. These are the type of cancer treatments that we have to consider when talking about fertility preservation. So surgery, gonadal surgery, neurosurgery that affects the hypothalamus pituitary and that would then affect the onward activation of ovarian function. And again, radiation and chemotherapy. chemotherapy. But most specifically are the stem cell therapy um, uh, treatments that we have, not so much in the stem cell transplant itself, but in the preconditioning treatments that come with alkylating agents, and those children are a significant risk. This is just an overview of the effect of gonadotoxic therapy. On the left here, you can see an ovary that is healthy, it's got growing follicles, then the growing follicles are exposed to chemotherapy and they're destroyed, as is the stromal vasculature. This is thought to, have, to happen between two uh, mechanisms. There is a direct toxic effect of chemotherapy that causes DNA damage that may not or may be repairable, or there is an indirect depletion whereby where the growing follicles are eliminated, AMH levels fall because we know that AMH is secreted by these growing follicles. And when we lose that inhibitory effect, the signaling pathways within the oocytes are accelerated and these next wave of follicles come up and then they're also wiped out by this chemotherapy and then that depletes significantly the primordial follicle pool. The impact of this then is that there is acute ovarian failure. Uh, a girl may not have periods for a certain amount of time. Um, they may, re may recover over time if there is a follicular pool that's left there to be restored or there's premature ovarian insufficiency, which is the equivalent of an early menopause in a young person, but probably has much more profound effects. With regards to surveillance of ovarian function, um, we assess our survivors clinically, biochemically, and ultrasonographically. So we look at, um, we establish whether or not their menses have returned, we look at their AMH levels because that's the most robust biological marker that we can use clinically, and based on ultrasound we will measure ovarian volume, um, but more specifically the antrophollicle count which we can see sonographically. This allows us to understand whether or not a person is in ovarian decline or is an established failure, and it also helps us to inform women of their reproductive uh, prospects. Um, with regard to AMH, as I said, it's really only interpretable in women who are over the age of 25. There's limited data in the interpretation in young girls and adolescents. We know that it can help us to predict the time to menopause in older, healthy women, and we use this as a guide when we are trying to identify young girls who are at risk of premature ovarian insufficiency. And it, thankfully, due to advances in technology, the assays that we use now to detect AMH levels can detect at quite a low level at 0 0.07 uh, picomoles per liter. And when we're in that range, we know that these girls are at risk of premature ovarian insufficiency within two years. 
This is a study that was conducted in our survivors that we saw through, coming through our clinic. It was a prospective review of 23, 23 females who benefited from the program. They were seen between the ages of 17 and 25 and had had cancer in childhood. Uh, we did a baseline fertility assessment, which thankfully showed that 70% of these girls actually do not have had a reassuring ovarian reserve. However, we identified that 30% may benefit from egg freezing in terms of uh, protecting their reproductive uh, health or reproductive potential. And there was a correlation between AMH and AFC, which is established in the literature, but there was no correlation between age and, uh, and uh, the AMH or the antral follicle count. We only saw 13 of these patients who followed up uh, with us at the year and two year mark. Um, and interestingly, and in, and in keeping with the, with the literature, AMH was actually stable in, uh, in the follow up. The women who have an ovarian decline, they're on an accelerated pathway, as one of our patients did with an AMH that fell from 35 to 15 picomoles, and she was recommended fertility preservation. So this is a, a kind of schematic that we use. This comes out of um, Edinburgh, and they are really the, the, the gurus of fertility preservation. Um, and in females, it just allows us to basically see that the options a female will have, if she needs fertility preservation post-pubertally, she can have eggs frozen or embryos frozen, and pre-pubertally, she needs to have ovarian tissue. So fertility preservation is a process of freezing gametes or reproductive tissues prior to starting cancer treatment, ideally, potentially after cancer treatment if in remission and if possible, so that a person can use them to have biological children in the future. This is what we do at assessment. We perform um, an ultrasound. You can see the ovary down here on the lower part of the screen, and those little black circles are the antral follicles that we count per ovary, and then we do a series of uh, hormone paneling, including FSH, LH, uh, anti-malarian hormone, and estradiol. We then recommend egg freezing for uh, a number of these patients. This is a, a cycle of IVF, basically, without the fertilization aspect. It was first employed in the 1980s. Uh, we know that the rapid vitrification is a more effective um, freezing modality and has no longer been deemed experimental and is very standardized in social egg freezing. So just a few words on um, just human follicle development. I just think it's valuable to understand how we work in the world of uh, fertility preservation. Um, on the top graph there, you can see a spontaneous cycle. So there is this concept of the FSH uh, threshold window. The, at the early part of the cycle, FSH rises. It's maintained abo above a certain threshold for about a week's time. During that time, a number of follicles are recruited into the cycle. Um, and feedback mechanisms with estrogen will actually cause FSH to decline, and then we'll have the atretic or the atresia of the majority of those follicles with only one dominant follicle developing. Next to this, you can see there is a, um, is it, you can see this here, this basically summarizes um, an IVF cycle. So we maintain, we extend and maintain the FSH uh, level higher than uh, physiologic doses and for a longer period of time, allowing all these cells to develop here, and we can capture those through an egg retrieval process. Below here is um, a graph that demonstrates how females, we used to think that females only had one cycle of follicular recruitment um, per cycle, but in fact, there are multiple waves. The majority of women will have two follicular waves, and some will even have three, and those are women with longer cycles. This is important to understand, um, particularly in the world of fertility preservation, where we're not worried about endometrial health and transferring an embryo because we're just freezing eggs for future use. Um, we can start this process at any stage in the cycle. So if someone is near ovulation, we can trigger them, we can uh, ovulate that cycle and then bring up the next wave. And that's very important in the sense of time. And it also allows us to do back-to-back -back cycles where we can maximize on the number of eggs that are um, available for freezing. This here is just to show what it looks like at egg retrieval. There's a transvaginal ultrasound that we place into the woman's vagina. A needle is then guided into the ovary. You can see there that there's a stimulated ovary at the bottom part of the page. That white echogenic uh, line is the needle that's in the follicle. We drain out the fluid. We pass it over to the lab, and hopefully the embryologist will be able to tell us that there is an egg um, visible or, or found in the fluid that we hand them. The, this is a, an egg that our lab will find. They'll stri strip back the granulosa cells, and they'll just have the zona pellucida with the egg in a polar body that's a metaphase two egg that has to be frozen. And they do this because it facilitates a more rapid freezing process. 
which it demonstrates here. So the vitrification process is rapid, and it's, um, it's, it's, it's done so with high concentrations of cryoprotectants that are thought to actually be um, toxic to cells. So this is an area of a development that is very much in need to um, advance and make this process more efficient. Um, the cryoprotectants, they bind with hydrogen, mo hydrogen molecules of uh, water. It prevents ice crystal formation. If ice crystals form, basically what happens is that it causes damage both osmotically and physically to the cell, and the eggs are, not, not, are no longer functional. The next option that women have is ovarian tissue cryopreservation. This is a surgical procedure. It doesn't come without risk. The tissue is removed, frozen, and can be thawed and used at a later date. This here is a, just a a cycle, I think it just summarizes it and breaks it down really well. We have a cancer diagnosis, we go for surgery, the person goes off and has cancer treatment, goes into complete remission, and then at a later stage, when wanting to use the tissue, can have it thawed and placed back into the abdominal cavity. So the advantages of ovarian tissue cryopreservation is that there's minimum time delay. It takes a couple of days to organize. That's not without great effort, but um, we don't have to rely on the ovarian function to recruit follicles and store eggs. Um, the added benefit of tissue is that when it is reimplanted, we can restore the endocrine function, um, and it can be offered to children and adolescents who are at risk of infertility. It's no longer considered an experimental technique, unlike testicular freezing, um, because we have demonstrated that we have live births that have um, uh, been born from this process. The disadvantages, however, are that they are surgical. So surgery has a risk of intra-abdominal organ damage, hemorrhage, death, all things that really need to be considered, particularly in small people, um, and the risk of malignant contamination. So we are very hesitant to reimplant tissue that has, a di if, if, if there's a diagnosis of ALL or uh, leukemia, this is because there's reintroduction uh, of potentially of malignant tissue. And this is where maybe our naked role mat, uh, rash might come in to help for helping us understand more about IV um, maturation and, uh, and other ways to mature these eggs. We use the Edinburgh criteria, which is a very robust tool in helping us to identify and select the appropriate person who is really at risk of developing premature ovarian insufficiency. <clears throat> we can see that there are a number of uh, people who have gone on to have ovarian tissue, but then subsequently have gone on to have spontaneous births, so maybe we haven't selected everyone um, appropriately. According to the Edinburgh criteria, women need to be less than 35, they have to have no previous chemotherapy, uh, they need a realistic chance of survival, they need to have a high risk of POI, um, and informed consent is, 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 uh, very, uh, is legally important. They need to have negative serology because they'll be sharing tissue banks with other people, so there is a risk of contamination. They need to not be pregnant and have no children. This is a, uh, an intraoperative just image, just to give you an idea of what it looks like. We have our uterus down low in the pelvis. This is uh, an 11-year-old ovary that's been um, removed. It's called an oophorectomy for ovarian tissue cryopreservation purposes. Um, the suspensory ligament is where all the vessels that supply the ovary with its blood supply um, live, and we basically ligate that and dissect it off. I've just pointed out this pelvic sidewall here because this is an area that we might use for reimplantation in the future. So it's important to understand what we're storing when we're talking about ovarian tissue. So the ovary is comprised of two compartments, the medulla and the cortex. The cortex is kind of like the skin that surrounds the medulla. And there we have the primordial follicle pool. Um, so at the top graph here, we're removing the entire ovary, which is typically what happens in pediatric patients because they have a smaller volume of tissue and it might be a safer procedure to do. We can remove part of the cortex, so sometimes we might take away half of the cortex of one ovary, so we might remove maybe 25% of the total ovarian cortex. And then, I'm less familiar with this technique, but there's circular biopsies. I'm not sure what the advantage is to that. Down here, what we have to do when we store tissue is we need to do a viability test to make sure that when we go to use the tissue in the future, that when we thought these um, follicles have survived. At the moment, when we thaw tissue, we lose over 50 to 60% of the follicles that are there originally. So a 40% yield following the thaw process is considered successful or normal. And again, that comes down to probably toxicity uh, and ischemia. So when we go back to reimplant this tissue, um, there's a couple of different techniques. Um, we can use the remaining ovary where tissue can be tunneled underneath the remaining cortex or sutured to the outside of it. 
this has tissue fragments that may not be able to be um, sutured in a practical term to the ovary, and therefore they can be injected in, uh, into the other ovary. This here is the strips. So when we take the ovarian cortex, we literally slice it into small uh, five millimeter strips, and then we suture them onto the remaining medulla. So if the cortex has been taken off the ovary, when we go back a number of years later, we literally suture these, um, these grafts onto the ovary. And then here you can see this is a pelvic sidewall that I demonstrated before. The uh, tissue that lies above it is quite flimsy and easy to open. We literally chuck about a third of the ovarian tissue in there. It's not very scientific, unfortunately. And then we cover it up. And then, lo and behold, uh, the tissue establishes itself over the next six-month period. The graph here shows pre-transplantation of ovarian tissue where we have high levels of FSH because there's no estrogen to suppress that. We need that to be the case, so if the, the, the woman is on contraception, she needs to come off that because we're relying on the physiologic function of the pituitary gland to activate this tissue. And then you can see that over about a four to six month period, we begin to get the natural cyclical function back again, which is pretty exciting. This woman was nine years of age when she had her egg, or when she had her ovary removed and frozen for beta thalassemia. She had to undergo a stem cell transplant, and she was rendered um, sterile, but went on to have a baby through ovarian tissue and IVF. And this is just another, the first case that was done, again, showing that stem cell transplant really do cause significant injury. So this is just a little bit of information about how we operate here in Ireland. We do not have a tissue bank here. Our we recently have received government funding for general fertility um, and IVF, but we have no support for pediatric or childhood um, fertility preservation, which is shocking. Um, we are part of or have been included historically into the hub and spoke model of the UK, uh, which we are not a part of, let's be clear. Um, but Oxford very much facilitates this for us. Um, so we can have tissue that you know, I suppose we have had one tissue that was um, removed here and then sent to Oxford, but since Brexit, these things have become very difficult, and now our patients have to travel to the United Kingdom. And when these children are sick, um, it becomes very cumbersome, and uh, now, we are, as we are no longer or commissioning site of, the, um, of these Oxford sites or Edinburgh, um, children will now have to pay up to 30,000 euros or pounds sterling if they wish to have this procedure done. <clears throat> this is the pathway that we have to follow, so just practically we have to identify the patient, refer them, they have to go through a consent process, surgery, tissue, and then um, the process of having it put back in the future. This is just a picture of a team at Surgical Collection here. They're removing the ovary at one of the spoke sites, and then the tissue is packaged. It's put into a, um, a validated shipping container so it can travel on ice for 24 hours before it needs to be um, processed and frozen. And then it makes its way to the center of interest, who, which is either Oxford or Edinburgh, where they have a tissue, a stem cell clean room. Uh, it's essential that we have a grade A air quality clean room in order to facilitate the process of this tissue. There has to be a human tissue authority license in order to facilitate this treatment and to uh, make sure that this is um, a validated process. And these are just some images here of what tissue actually processing looks like. It's, it's not technically very um, difficult, um, but it is ethically very sensitive. So we have an ovary here, uh, and uh, this is when it arrives into the uh, grade, air, grade A air hub. Um, over here, this is uh, an embryologist or a scientist that's um, basically cutting the cortex off the medulla. Down here, the cortex, it is now just is spread out and it's been getting ready for processing. This is the tissue in here that's cut into small little bits. Um, there may be primordial follicles floating around in that fluid as well, so we like to capture those and freeze those. And you can see here how small those strips really are. And again, this is just the cryopreservation and that we need to have tissue cryopreservation um, tissue authority involved in this. And then they have to be re-transplanted in the sites where the tissue is stored because unlike the freezing process, where you have two, 24 hours, you only have 20 minutes to, to, to um, transplant this tissue. I came across this interesting paper um, by Otke and, or Octe and colleagues. Um, he's active in the space of fertility preservation, and I thought it might be something that would be interesting to talk about. Um, and the question is, can elective ovarian cryopreservation also be used to extend the duration of reproductive function and delay the menopause? If you look at the top graph here, 
this is presuming that we have 100% um, primordial follicle survival following the freeze and thaw process when we are nowhere near that. But if you look at the decline, and if a woman at the age of 30 has her ovarian tissue removed, about 25% of that, she should, I suppose, predictably go through a normal menopause. Just before she does, the idea is that we re-implant this tissue and she goes back to normal function. And that tissue can last up to 11 to 12 years. So when we, when we re-implant tissue, we do it in thirds. So technically, she will have over 30 years of uh, reproductive function and hormonal um, uh, support uh, for the rest of her life. Um, the graph below here shows a more realistic, I suppose, um, trajectory that at the age of 30, with a 40% survival, she may have seven years of, um, of delayed menopause. But there are clinical implications to consider here. Um, there's a risk of breast cancer, endometrial cancer, ovarian cancers. Uh, there's benign gynecological issues that have to be considered. Does this woman have a healthy, did this woman have a healthy uh, pelvis before she had ovarian tissue removed? Is there presence of endometriosis, PCOS? Did her periods wreck her life before she had the, uh, before she went with menopause, fix that with a reintroduction of exogenous hormones? These are real practical things to consider in addition to the um, surgical risks and making sure that we're selecting the appropriate patient in somebody that has an accelerated ovarian decline. Are we going to be then be putting this person into a premature menopause because we have removed her ovary? So, at the moment, uh, this is not supported by the American Society of Reproductive Medicine, nor by the European Society. Um, it is only advised for the replacement for fertility and not for hormonal function. Uh, we have exogenous treatments to address this uh, that can also benefit the, the time of perimenopause, which is probably the time that wreaks the most havoc uh, in women's lives, and then the long-term benefit of cardiac and bone protection. However, um, this important study, uh, this study is, is very important because it does, I suppose, address the questions that we need to answer. Where is the value? Do we need to look at ovarian tissue in a, a experimental context or in a scientific context and get information for that and then use technology to replace its function? So um, thank you very much for your attention. It's a pleasure to speak. Thank you. I think there is one there. Great talk. That's a great talk. And uh, I mean, I think as um, a menopausal woman, um, I'm listening to all the things that you discuss, and maybe that's why I'm asking so many questions. But you know, let's think about this huge difference between biological males and females. You know, by the time I'm 35, I'm going to have to scramble to find a mate, to have a litter of children. It's going to wreck a scientific career or any other career, really. And then I'm looking down the lens towards you know, 40 years in absolute bits unless I get a hormone replacement. But you suggested that the idea that, all right, this radical approach of you know, taking ovaries when you're much younger, freezing them and then re-implanting them when you're older is for fertility. But could we take uh, ovaries from an eight-year-old, uh, an eight-year-old me, and then when I'm hitting 40, 50, re-implant it and I could keep on having kids? And so, and is this a way, because they said you can only do it, it's not to replace hormones, but it's for fertility. Why should we stop having children when we're 40, 50, if we want to? That's an excellent question. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to take that. Um, so... Are you going to go through an unnecessary surgical procedure at the age of eight for who knows what? Okay, um, that's one thing. Tissue is very exciting. You know, I, I think it's, 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 it's new, it's novel, it's got stem cells. You know, it's, it's really exciting. But in the reality of it all is that we also need to think about the way we look at aging as well and the message that we're sending women. And I, I feel very passionate about this because um, you know, we're encouraging women to freeze their eggs, to, to take all these interventions so they can have their kids later on in life. But what people don't really understand, and this is the obstetrician in me, is that I would hate to see a 50-year-old, and I do hate to see a 52-year-old with twins coming in through the door because she had a donation. She's got cardiovascular problems. She's going to have preeclampsia, fetal growth restriction. 
diabetes, and then the implications of all of that on preterm birth, being left with a very disabled child that society now needs, I mean, it goes on. So I, I think that is not the reason um, why we do that. I think it's fertility in the appropriate context, and it's those who are genuinely at risk. And, that this is, and, and cancer is a growing, um, it's a growing cohort of people. I think our, our chances are significant that we're all going to have cancer. I think it's at one in two. So uh, as we see childhood survivors, you know, there's, there, these are the kids that need to be minded and looked after. And this is where the longevity space will actually change their lives. Um, because they will live a normal lifespan, but it will be in bits. So, um, yeah, and I think, you know, 70% of these kids will have some late effect, fertility being one of them. Thanks. Um, hello. Uh, so, what would be the best age to freeze your eggs if you're like an older woman and thinking about having children later? And is there a time frame um, for freezing? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's that's a very good question. And I think I'm seeing more and more young women coming through. Um, our clinics who are being proactive about freezing their eggs, and it is a really good security blanket to have, but there's no guarantee that that will give you a baby. So if you're going to have a baby from a frozen egg, <clears throat> you'll need to freeze at least about 18 to 20 eggs because each um, oocyte will give you about a 5% chance of a live birth. So that's not very high. And then you've got your male factor as well. So are you going to meet somebody that's got very poor sperm quality? What is the embryology? How much can you troubleshoot? So when we're freezing eggs, it's not, it's not a free-for-all that your reproductive prospects are intact. The best age to do that would probably be late 20s, I would say, maybe early 30s. Um, but late 20s would be the best time. Too young, you know, women under the age of 21, they, they have very high aneuploidy, so a lot of these, these cells are abnormal. Uh, and we don't know enough about that, but as we are working with childhood cancer um, and survivors of childhood cancer, we'll begin to know more about that down the line. Mm 